gave it human qualities. We're ready to go? Okay. In the New Testament, we find a tree that also was under God's curse. Notice it. Next slide, sweetie. Matthew 21, 18 to 20. It says, In the morning as he returned to the city, he hungered. When he saw a fig tree in the way, he came to it and found nothing thereon but leaves only, and said to it, Let no fruit grow on thee henceforward forever. And presently the fig tree withered away. When the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, How soon is the fig tree withered away? So we have here in Matthew 21, just as we had in Jeremiah 11, we have a cursed tree, a cursed tree. Desire of Ages tells us the cursing of the fig tree was an acted parable. That barren tree flaunting its pretentious foliage in the very face of Christ was a symbol of the Jewish nation. The Savior desired to make plain to His disciples the cause and certainty of Israel's doom. For this purpose, He invested the tree with moral qualities and made it the expositor of divine truth. Now that's in the chapter, Cleansing of the Temple and Desire of Ages. And I'm sorry, I don't have the exact reference. But it's in Desire of Ages. Cleansing of the Temple, yeah. Um, pretty sure. So, folk, we have a statement in the Old Testament. We have a statement in the New Testament. And I believe you can find oodles and oodles of other statements where fruitful trees represent God's prospering people. A cursed tree or a burned up tree would represent God's people in apostasy. Based on that information, this is the conclusion that I have drawn. Okay? This first trumpet in history represents the judgments that fell on apostate Israel in 70 AD. So that is how I believe the first trumpet applies historically, okay, had application in history, I believe it has application in the very near future. What would it apply to? This trumpet in the future represents the judgments that will fall on apostate Adventism sometime soon. We don't know when. Now, folk, we also have, in reference to this first trumpet and judgments falling on apostate Seventh-day Adventism, of course, we have in Ezekiel chapter 9, where the Bible says that judgment will begin. Where does it begin? It begins at the house of God. That's right. And that is apostate Seventh-day Adventism will suffer judgments from heaven. You say, well, Bill, I'm, I'm sure glad I'm in a self-supporting church and, and that makes me safe. Folk, the only thing that makes any of us safe is that I am submitting my life to Jesus Christ on a day-by-day -day basis. If I am not, folk, if I personally am not, and I am choosing to do wrong, you know what? This judgment will fall on me. It will fall on me. It will fall on any one of us. That is why I must be making a decision day by day when the devil comes at me with temptation. What will I do with temptation? Will I turn to Christ and say, Lord, 
I need your power in my life. Will I do that? Or will I choose to imbibe the temptation and commit wrong acts against God? You see, folk, every decision we make every day counts. It counts. And if I choose, or any one of us choose, a path where we are excusing sin in our lives, I guarantee you today, the judgments of God will fall on us. Next slide. The second trumpet. The Bible says the second angel sounded, and as it were a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea. The third part of the sea became blood. The third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died. The third part of the ships were destroyed. Well, I've underlined right here a great mountain that's burning with fire and it's thrown into the sea. Well, I believe, folk, that this is the most important symbol in this second trumpet. What is this burned up mountain that's destroyed and everything connected with it is destroyed? What is that? Well, let's take a look at the Bible and see what it says about a burnt mountain. Watch this. Jeremiah 51, 24 and 25. Jeremiah said, I will render the Lord through Jeremiah. I will render to Babylon and to all the inhabitants of Chaldea all their evil that they have done in Zion in your sight, saith the Lord. And notice how the Bible describes Babylon, which was the greatest nation on the face of the earth in Jeremiah's day. Behold, I am against thee. Look here. O destroying mountain. So Babylon is referred to as a mountain. The mightiest nation in the world, it's a mountain which destroyest all the earth, saith the Lord, and I will stretch out mine hand upon thee and roll thee down from the rocks and will make thee, what? A burnt mountain. Now, folk, that's exactly what the second trumpet is talking about, is a burnt mountain. And right here in Jeremiah 51, Babylon, the mightiest nation on the earth, is going to be made a burnt mountain. Why? Because Babylon had turned away from Christ and was destroying others. And Jeremiah said, Babylon, you are going to suffer the judgments of God. And you are a burnt mountain. Well, folk, sometime after the fall of apostate Israel in 70 AD, sometime after that, the mightiest nation on the face of the earth at that time, John was told it would be cast into the sea, it would be destroyed. Can you think of the mightiest nation on the earth sometime in the first few centuries of the Christian era that was destroyed because they had turned away from the God of heaven? Can you think of one? Reggie? Did you say something? No, you didn't. Okay. Well... A burnt mountain represents a mighty nation that will suffer judgments from God. In history, the second trumpet applies to pagan Rome. 
Was pagan Rome the mightiest nation on the face of the earth in the first few centuries of the Christian era? Absolutely it was. They ruled the world, folk. They were the iron kingdom of Daniel chapter 2. And pagan Rome suffered heaven's judgments because they rejected the truth that was sent to them by the apostles and the prophets. Now, what is the mightiest nation on the earth today that has received so many blessings from God, folks? The United States of America. Will America suffer judgments because of their rejection of the truth of God? Will America? Absolutely. Nellie, there's no doubt. We're seeing already the, the, the things that continue to go on, the $16.7 trillion debt the America folk, America is becoming the world's laughing stock while it still remains as the only superpower in this world. But thinking people, thinking people today, look at America and say, that nation is going off the deep end. What's that, Nellie? Oh, economically, absolutely. Absolutely. At the end of time, the second trumpet applies to America, who will feel heaven's displeasure for squandered opportunities. You see, folk, that burnt mountain again, According to Jeremiah 51, it represented the greatest nation on the face of the earth in Jeremiah's day. Well, in those trumpets in Revelation chapter 8, judgments on apostate nations, that mountain is pagan Rome and then the United States at the end of time. Next slide. The third trumpet, Revelation 8, 10, 11, it says there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp, fell upon the third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of waters, and the name of the star is called Wormwood. And the third part of the waters became Wormwood, and many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. Now let's take a look at a couple of these symbols in Revelation chapter 1, we were told that the stars represented what? Angels. That's right. The stars represent angels, and angels give messages. So it says here that a star, somebody has proclaimed to be given a message from heaven, burning as it were a lamp, claiming to be using the Bible, claiming to be a messenger for God that comes right from the Bible. But when it falls, folk, the waters become bitter like wormwood. And instead of people receiving a blessing and being enriched and challenged in their relationship with God, instead, people are dying after drinking of that message. Because it says, they were made bitter. So obviously, well, let's go next slide. Let's see. Star represents an angel giving a message. Seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. The angel falls, or the star falls from heaven, carries a lamp. We know that the lamp in the Bible are represents the Bible itself. Psalm 119, 105 says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Well, folk, what we have then in this third trumpet 
we have people claiming to have a message from God and they, they're claiming that they're getting it right from the Bible. But when people drink of the message, it's not a message of holiness, it's not a message of purity and enrichment. Folk, it's a message that leaves people bitter and angry, and people die because they're not hearing the truth of heaven. The mixture of truth and error produces bitterness or wormwood. That's the result of mixing truth and error. Next slide. Here is my application of the third trumpet. When the early church gradually apostatized and began compromising with error, false teaching was the result. See, folk, the early church that started getting involved in the teachings of Origen, Clement of Alexandria, Tertullian, Augustine, they started mixing Mixing allegory and tradition with the Bible. That's what happened. And so instead of people being enriched, they became bitter and people started dying because they weren't hearing the truth. Judgments of God fell on pagan Christianity for this gross apostasy. That, I believe, is the fulfillment of the third trumpet. Judgments on pagan Christianity. And what is pagan Christianity? It's simply the blending of false teachings that lead to an immoral, gross lifestyle, mixing that with the principles of the Bible. That's what pagan Christianity is. It's kind of like the concept today of Christian rock. That's what it is. See, it's the blending of two things that are mutually exclusive. That's what you had, folk, in the early church. In the early church. The third trumpet is judgment on that form of baptized paganism. Well, at the end of time, judgment will fall on that form of Protestantism that has rejected the Bible. It will fall on that form of Protestantism that has rejected the Ten Commandments. Apostate Protestantism has done the exact same thing that went on in the early centuries of the Christian era. And apostate Protestantism will yet suffer divine retribution for this wickedness. Folk, we see such a drive today whereby apostate Protestantism is trying so hard to unite with government and to take it over. The result of that will be wormwood, it will be bitterness, and it will only end in divine judgment on that wickedness. Next slide. The fourth trumpet, notice what we have. The fourth angel sounded, the third part of the sun was smitten, the third part of the moon, and the third part of the stars. So as the third part of them was darkened, and the day shone not for a third part of it, and the night likewise. Obviously we have those elements in nature 
that are no longer giving light. The sun, the moon, and the stars are not giving their light. They become darkened. The world becomes a dark place. Now when we think of in history, was there a time in history where the light of Bible truth, the light of the Ten Commandments, where there was an attempt to blot those things out? Was there an attempt in history to do that? What do we call that time period in history? What do we call it? The Dark Ages. The Dark Ages. I believe, folk, this is talking about the time that we know of in Bible history as the Dark Ages. When those elements in nature that give light were cut off. And likewise, in the spiritual realm, the light of the Bible, the Ten Commandments, Christ in heaven, all of those things were obliterated from the minds of people. And we had a dark age. That dark age in history came about when the papacy or the Roman Catholic system was allowed to take over the world during the dark ages. And the papacy filled the earth with moral and spiritual darkness. She's doing the same thing today. Same thing today, folks. Next slide. Darkness ensued under the fourth trumpet. All light-giving forces are out. And what a fitting symbol of the dark ages of this earth's history. I know in the book Great Controversy, Ellen White states that the noontime of the papacy was the midnight of the world. That's the way it was during the time of papal supremacy. And folk, if God did not intervene, did not Christ plan and will come again. If he didn't, do you know where this world is going today? We are heading to another dark age. That's where we're heading. Another dark age. Where the light of the truth of God in the Bible and the Ten Commandments are being obliterated from this earth. So the fourth trumpet represents judgments that fell on the papacy for her wickedness. This will ultimately culminate in the judgments that will fall on the papacy in the future when Babylon the Great comes into remembrance before God. Of course, friend, the fourth trumpet, I believe, corresponds perfectly with the judgments that we see to fall on the papacy in Revelation 17 and 18. Next slide. Now the next two trumpets that are discussed in Revelation chapter 9, this is the only trumpet of all of the seven that Ellen White specifically mentions. It's the only one. We read about it last week in Great Controversy, pages 334 and 335, in which Ellen White states that the time periods in those two trumpets correspond to the rise of the Muslim world and that they were a scourge on humanity and for their cruelty Islam suffered judgment from God in 1840. 
Now that's how Ellen White describes Great Controversy, pages 334 and 335. I'll just read this section here. It says, allowing the first period of the 150 years to have been exactly fulfilled before Diakosis ascended the throne by permission of the Turks, and that the 391 years and 15 days commenced at the close of the first period, Ellen White said it will end on the 11th of August, 1840, when the Ottoman power in Constantinople may be expected to be broken. And this, I believe, will be found to be the case. And Ellen White is quoting here from Josiah Litch in Signs of the Times, Expositor Prophecy, August 1, 1840. And Ellen White's comment was, she said, at the very time specified, Turkey, through her ambassadors, accepted the protection of the Allied powers of Europe and thus placed herself under the control of Christian nations. The event exactly fulfilled the prediction. So Ellen White, in Great Controversy 334 and 335, declares that the rise of Islam, they're being used as a scourge through the latter part of the Dark Ages, all the way up to the 18th and 19th centuries, that Islam was the fulfillment of the fifth and sixth trumpets. Now let's see if we can get a little bit more detail on that. Josiah Litch's comment, uh, the fall of the Ottoman Empire, the impact of Muslim Turkey upon Europe after the fall of Constantinople in 1453 was as severe as had been the catastrophic conquest of the Muslim Saracens during the century and a half after the death of Muhammad upon the Eastern Roman Empire. Throughout the Reformation era, of course, Muslim Turkey was a continual threat at the eastern gates of European Christendom. Uh, the writings of the reformers are full of condemnation of the Ottoman power. Christian writers since have been concerned with the role of Turkey in future world events. Commentators on prophecy have seen Turkish power and its decline forecast in scripture. Folk, an interesting parallel with this and what we see today is that during the time of the Reformation, the papacy came to the reformers and said, we must unite together to defeat the common enemy. And they said the common enemy was the Muslims. Folk, we are seeing the same idea repeated today. The same idea. The Catholic Church, the apostate Protestants, and apostate Adventism, they are uniting together to go and to defeat the common enemy. And who is the common enemy today? Islam. Islam. It's the same mentality today. And folk, mark my words, at some point we will all be told we must unite together with the papacy and apostate religious organizations because we must defeat the common enemy, which is Islam. There's nothing new under the sun, Nellie. That's exactly, exactly right. Next slide. Now, in Revelation 9, verses 5 and 10, it talks about a period of time of five months when this power would torment the world. Now, of course, folk, five months, 30 days to a Bible month, that's 150 days. A day in prophecy represents a year. 
So in Revelation 9, verse 5 and verse 10, when it talks about this five-month period, it's talking about a 150-year period in which the Muslim world assaulted Eastern apostate Christianity. Next slide. Now, Revelation 9, verse 15, under the sixth trumpet, refers to another time period. It says, The four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour, a day, a month, and a year, for to slay the third part of men. Now, folk, right here, if you add up prophetic time, a year, a month, a day, and an hour, you get 391 years and 15 days. Ellen White declared that this time period would end August 11, 1840. So if you take the 391 years and the 15 days, add it to the other time period of 150 years, and you subtract it from August 11, 1840, you come to July 27, 1299. Next slide. And you find that it was in July 27 of 1449 that the Ottomans, the Muslim Ottomans of Turkey, harassed and tormented the Eastern Empire of Rome, and it began, folk, on that very date. Next slide. The application of these two trumpets, the fifth and sixth trumpets, God used the Islamic peoples to be a scourge to the Roman Empire and the papacy for centuries. They gradually fell apart and suffered judgments from heaven by 1840. One day soon, Islam, for their evils that they commit in this world, Islam will receive a final judgment from God for their apostasy. Now some people have disagreed with my understanding on the trumpets because they say, well, how about those two time periods? They applied in history, where do they apply in the future? Well, folk, we know that the last time period the last prophetic time period ended in what year? When did the last time period end? 1844. So there is no more prophetic time after 1844. So this aspect of the sixth, fifth and sixth trumpets and the time periods that are found in those trumpets because it takes place after probation closes and every person has made a decision for or against God, folk, there will be no more decisions. There will be no more time prophecy after the close of probation. Next slide. Lastly, you have the seventh trumpet in Revelation 11, verses 15 to 19. Now what we have, folk, is the sixth trumpet ended in Revelation chapter 9. The seventh trumpet is not mentioned in Revelation chapter 10, and it's not mentioned in the first part of Revelation chapter 11. It is discussed right at the end of that chapter. We're going to look, God willing, in Revelation chapter 10 and in the first part of Revelation chapter 11 over the next couple of weeks. But the seventh trumpet is finally mentioned 
at the very end of Revelation chapter 11. This is what it says. The seventh angel sounded. There were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ. He shall reign forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders which sat before God on their seats fell upon their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and wast and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and hast reigned. The nations were angry, thy wrath is come. The time of the dead that they should be judged and that thou shouldest give reward to thy servants, the prophets, to the saints, to them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament. There were lightnings, voices, thunderings, and an earthquake, and great hail. So the seventh trumpet, in the context of the seven trumpets, it's going to come sometime after the fall of the Muslim Ottoman Empire in 1840. And it's going to do, have to do with judgments. Now notice this right here in the seventh trumpet. And the time of the dead that they should be judged. When were the dead going to be judged? Give me a date. Not at the second coming. 1844. The time of the dead that they should be judged, that began in 1844. And that thou should givest reward to thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and to them that fear thy name, small and great. And should destroy them which destroy the earth. Now all of those things will result from and will take place when Christ comes. He will give rewards at his coming. Um, he will destroy those that destroyed the earth. Now... The temple of God was opened in heaven and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament. When did that take place? When Christ went into the most holy place. That's right, Nellie. When Christ went to the most holy place, the temple of God was opened in heaven and that's when the law of God was seen was in 1844. So right here at the end of the trumpets, right here at the end, we have judgment. We have a time when Christ will come, which is also a time of judgment. And then we have mention of the most holy place and Christ beginning his most holy place ministry of judgment. And that is in 1844. So we see folk as we conclude the trumpets, we see them finishing off with the ultimate judgment that will take place in the time of 1844. Next slide. That is how Ellen White describes the temple of God being opened in heaven. It's a clear reference to 1844 and the beginning of the investigative judgment. Next slide. The seventh trumpet fits perfectly into our understanding of the trumpets being warnings and judgments. The last trumpet brings us down to the final judgment of all mankind, beginning in 1844 and ending when Christ throws down the censer at the close of probation. Judgments, though long deferred, still come. God's strange act of fathomless patience exhausted. Yet judgment will fall, for the trumpets tell us so. You know, folk, again, in our study of the trumpets, I believe it fits right into the concept that the book of Revelation is a revelation about Christ. And it reveals what he does, what he does, 
when people ultimately decide for him or against him. And I believe the trumpets pull back the curtain and say, when God's patience is finally exhausted and he can do no more to try to save humanity, then judgments ultimately are the result. And that's what the trumpets are all about. Finally, and we will close with this passage of Scripture in Joel 2. Joel says, Blow ye the trumpet in Zion. Sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. Trumpets remain and are still blowing to each one of us today to prepare to meet your God. Let us pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for this study on the trumpets that lets us know in no uncertain terms that sin has a consequence. Thank you so much for the gospel that tells us that sin can be forgiven. Thank you so much for the trumpets that let us know that if sin is not forsaken, that if it's clung to, there is an ultimate judgment upon it. We thank you today that in each of our lives that the mercy, the compassion, the driving power of the Holy Spirit to reach us, to save us from our sins is still there. It's still available for each one of us. I pray, Father, that you would strengthen us to share this divine and wonderful blending of your character in our lives with others. In Christ's name I pray. Amen.